Okay, so the uh, talk title is uh, introducing the virus bio, bio uh, sisters, a new electrochemical biosensing paradigm. Uh, let's welcome Professor Penner with big hand. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I'd like to thank Professor Ildu Kim for the lovely invitation to be part of the panel and to present this talk uh, this morning. Um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, is a project in my group that really aims to try and develop um, point of care biosensors for the detection, initially at least, of bladder cancer at an early stage using a urinalysis test. So that's what this talk is going to be about, and, and that's what the virus bioresistor does. Hmm. So these are the two uh, graduate students who invented it. Uh, Alana Ogata uh, graduated a couple of years ago and postdoc with Dave Wald, and then um, is a, a faculty member now at the University of Toronto. And Apoorva Basin uh, graduated just last year, and she's a senior scientist in a startup company named PhageTech that's commercializing the technology that I'm gonna be talking about today. The current group working on the virus bioresistor shown here, uh, Apoorva is still uh, an ex officio member of the group. She's in the lab all the time uh, doing science, even though she's not getting paid by me. Uh, but Eric and Nick are uh, third year graduate students working on this project. So in, in one slide, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. We've developed a, a very simple uh, biosensor and that's shown in these cartoons uh, in the left part of this slide. And the biosensor just consists of two gold electrodes and a polymer channel that connects them together that has two layers. The bottom layer is just a spin coated P.PSS uh, conductor, all right? It serves no purpose other than to allow us to electrodeposit the top layer, the top layer consists of electrodeposited P dot or an electrically, electronically conductive polymer that has virus particles entrained within it. And so these are M13 virus particles that are engineered to recognize and bind a particular bladder cancer marker in urine. And what we do is we expose these uh, sensors to uh, to urine that contains the, um, the molecules that we're trying to detect. For example, human serum albumin is a marker for bladder cancer. And um, we assess uh, the response of the sensor to that. We make an impedance measurement between these two gold electrodes. And um, what we find is when the virus particles recognize and bind uh, their target molecule from the solution, the impedance between these two gold electrodes goes up, and that's shown on the right-hand side of this slide. And so the question is, can we use this idea uh, to build biosensors that have any degree of practicality for detecting bladder cancer? That's the question I'm going to try and answer today. So I'm gonna start by talking a, just a little bit more about bladder cancer, what the unique challenges are uh, in detecting this disease at an early stage. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, viruses a little bit and talk about how we prepare bioaffinity layers from viruses. That'll be the second part of the talk. Then I'll talk about making VBRs and show you exactly how we do that and, and um, what parameters we can tune to adjust the properties of these biosensors. And finally, I'll say a few words about what we believe to be the mechanism of detection uh, that is exploited by the VBR, which we think is uh, unique and really hasn't been exploited in biosensing before. So I'll talk about cancer first, then the viruses, then virus bioresistors, and I'll talk a little bit about how they work. So bladder cancer, it turns out, kills about 200,000 people worldwide uh, a year. And in, in the U.S., it's about 17,000 people. And uh, the tragedy with bladder cancer is it's almost always detected in stage three and stage four. And the reason for that is really shown on this slide here. You know, bladder cancer, 95% of the time, is a cancer that closely resembles skin cancer. It's growing on the inside skin surface of your bladder, 
right? That skin is called the ural thelium. And when it starts growing, it's, it's only, you know, a, a few microns in diameter. That would be the stage zero that's shown in this cartoon here. And it grows very slowly, typically. You know, it can take a year to become a millimeter or so in diameter quite often. And it can take longer than that before you start to notice any symptoms from the bladder cancer that you're carrying around. And during this period, it would be common for a lot of people to visit a doctor, okay? Some of us see doctors once a year, or maybe once every two years. And if there was a routine exam that was done at that doctor's visit that allowed you to detect a bladder cancer, it would be discovered long before you have any symptoms at all. But what typically happens is this cancer grows and within between one and two years, it punches into this smooth muscle layer of your bladder. And when that happens, you find blood in your urine and that prompts you to go to the doctor. 99% of the time, blood in your urine means a urinary tract infection that's treated with an antibiotic. You'll be treated with the antibiotic in six days, the blood should be gone. And when it's not, you go back to your doctor he sends you to a urologist and the urologist puts a fiber optic uh, a fiber up to your urethra and he looks around on the inside of your bladder and he finds this cancer. And at that point, you're stage three or stage four and you have to fight like crazy, right? To defeat the disease. What the tragic part is that this cancer, even in stage zero and stage one is spewing distinctive proteins into your urine stream that could be detected, all right? Possibly uh, in stage zero and stage one, all right? That's the goal of this project is to develop the biosensor necessary to do point of care detection of these um, distinctive bladder cancer markers. This is the, uh, the tool that is used in your annual urinalysis. This is the Roche-Comber 10. It measures the concentration of 10 different uh, metabolites. None of these related to the presence of cancer in your bladder or, or in your uh, kidneys for that matter, with the possible exception of blood, right? But again, blood is almost always uh, a marker for urinary tract infection. So the goal, uh, the global goal of this project is to replace this, uh, um, or actually to augment this uh, uh, dipstick uh, detector for 10 different metabolites with something that looks like the device at the right, right, where these blue squares here, each pair of blue squares is a single virus bioresistor that detects a different um, cancer marker for bladder cancer, because there isn't a single golden uh, uh, um, bladder cancer marker that reliably allows you to diagnose bladder cancer. You need to detect two or three of them in parallel before you can make a, uh, um, a confident diagnosis of the disease. And so that's one of the challenges with bladder cancer is that there isn't a single silver bullet that you can measure that'll allow you to detect the disease. You need to measure several. The good news is we know what to measure, all right? The, the efficacy of bladder cancer markers is well understood. There are some that are FDA approved. NMP22 is one of them. BTA, bladder tumor antigen, is another FDA approved bladder cancer marker. DJ1 is a new bladder cancer marker that is, uh, folks are excited about. It shows a lot of promise, but it's not yet FDA approved. These are the three that we're focusing our attention on at the moment. We also know what concentrations we need to measure for these three markers, because we know what the concentrations of these markers are in, in patients who have bladder cancer, right? And those are listed in this slide. And so from an analytical chemistry perspective, we know exactly what we need to be able to do to diagnose this disease. We have all the information we need. We don't have to pioneer any new bladder cancer markers to solve this problem. There aren't uh, existing devices that do a good job of, of this. And this is really not pertinent to this talk since we're not talking about the commercialization of this device, but the closest is a, a device from Abbott called the Bladder Check. It measures NMP22 only. And as I said, no single uh, biomarker is, is a good indicator of whether you have bladder cancer or not. So NMP22 doesn't have great 
sensitivity or selectivity. And you really need to augment it with uh, one or two other uh, markers, which is really what we're trying to do in the experiments I'm gonna be talking about today. But suffice it to say is there's an opportunity in the marketplace to improve upon the existing state of the art for these point of care sensors. Okay, so one of the distinctive uh, aspects of the devices we're building is that they employ virus particles as receptors instead of antibodies. We're gonna be detecting proteins in urine, right? And, and typically antibodies are used for that purpose in all kinds of biosensors, but we're gonna be using virus particles. And the, there's really three motivations for this. And the most important motivation possibly is that the virus particles that we're using are um, highly thermal, thermally stable, right? They, they can even be stable up to 85 degrees C uh, in aqueous solutions. And, and so it's, it's not going to be necessary at the end of the day to ever refrigerate one of the biosensors that we're developing using these viruses because the viruses uh, aren't concerned about whether the temperature is 35 degrees or 45 degrees. They're really in, uh, incredibly stable um, under these uh, conditions. And so that's a huge advantage. There won't have to be a cold chain involved in the transport of these biosensors to third world countries or, or something to that effect. The second consideration is, is these viruses are uh, incredibly cheaper than antibodies. And, and those of you who you in, are involved in using antibodies in your work every day know exactly what I'm talking about, know exactly how expensive monoclonal antibodies are. And to a first approximation, you know, the virus particles are a factor of one one hundredth of the cost of antibodies. All right. Uh, and I'm talking about virus particles that are engineered to recognize and bind with very similar affinities to the best antibodies, all right? 10 to the minus nine or 10 of the KDs in the 10 to the minus nine or 10 to the minus 10 range uh, are, are quite common amongst uh, these engineered virus particles. The final consideration is that we want to be able to bring these devices to market at some point and, and to patent the work that we're doing. And um, the, the problem with that in, in, in biosensor science is that there's uh, an incredible number of biosensors and very little white space to be creative within. And um, when it comes to virus enabled biosensors, there's virtually no uh, uh, prior art right, to compete with. And so there's tremendous flexibility in, in what you can um, patent and develop uh, in this space of virus enabled biosensors. And, and that turns out to be a big advantage if you actually want to get these things into a doctor's office at some point in time, you need to be able to patent them and manufacture them. So let me just say a couple more words about the virus. There's probably a lot more that ought to be said, but I'm not the one who makes the virus particles. It's my collaborator, uh, Greg Weiss, uh, a chemical biologist at UC Irvine who's responsible for this part of the project. But suffice it to say, what Greg does is he uses a technique called phage display to develop um, M13 virus particles that have these little orange pigtails appended uh, to the um, end terminus of, these, of this uh, majority coat peptide of the protein, of, of the virus rather. Right? And these orange pigtails are non-natural uh, amino acids uh, uh, peptides rather that are between seven and 25 um, amino acid residues in length. And they are engineered to recognize and bind the cancer marker that we're trying to detect. And this is done through a process called phage display and panning. And it's uh, extremely elegant what he's able to do in his, his laboratory. He starts off with uh, a library of 10 to the 12 unique um, amino acid sequences on these virus particles and then selects from that gi gigantic library members of it that recognize um, and bind the cancer marker we're interested in with high affinity and high selectivity. And at the end of the day, we're looking for KD values in the 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 10 range. Uh, that typically gets us the kinds of limits of a detection that we need to um, detect the bladder cancer markers that we're trying to detect at the concentrations that they exist uh, in, in single patient urine samples. So this is Greg Weiss's group. These are some of the people who have been, uh, we've been working with uh, to, to use the viruses that they prepare 
for us to detect these um, molecules that I'll be talking about. And so we're, uh, we've been working together on this project for about 12 years. And uh, the biosensor I'll be talking about today was really developed about four years ago. Now we've got viruses that will selectively and, and strongly bind uh, the cancer markers that we're interested in, but we don't have any idea how to build a bioaffinity layer from these viruses because uh, that's not in the literature, right? How do you build a bioaffinity layer that's based on a filamentous phage that is a micron long and six nanometers in diameter? We didn't know the answer and we've been working on that problem for about 12 years. and. Uh, you know, what we need to be able to do is collect these vi virus particles onto a biosensor surface in such a way that we don't damage them in that process. Then we need to wire them so that we can electrically detect whether they've recognized and bound the molecule that we're trying to detect, right? So there has to be some wiring uh, done for the viruses. And then we have to understand how to extract signal from um, the response that we see from the viruses, right? How do you extract the signal? What is the signal going to look like? So these are all things that factor into the development of a bioaffinity layer. And we developed six, probably six different methods for, for uh, attaching virus particles to glass surfaces and gold electrode surfaces and other types of metals. And what we finally settled on is shown in this slide. All right, we, what we discovered quite by accident is that when you Electropolymerize P dot, right, from the E dot monomer, right, you can do this electrochemically, of course. And what you do is you oxidize E dot, and, and the um, uh, cation radical that is formed in that oxidation process couples with other radicals near the electrode surface, forms ligamers, these crash out of solution, and you form a P dot layer um, on, on your electrode surface. During that process, the P dot that forms has a partial positive charge. Every five or six uh, monomer units has a positive charge. And so anions have to be incorporated into the polymer as it grows. Now, by some stroke of luck, virus particles, these M13 virus particles are, are covered with 6,000 negative charges. They're highly negatively charged objects. And so when we, what we found is when we electropolymerize P dot in the presence of nanomolar concentration of these virus particles, right? Nanomolar concentrations, they're extremely efficiently incorporated into the growing polymer film. And that was surprising. And so the observation is, is shown here. This is just a cyclic voltammogram in which we're measuring the current as we oxidize that E dot monomer, right? As a function of potential. And this is the oxidation current involved in the oxidation of the E dot and in the formation of the polymer, right? The polymer is being formed as we oxidize the E dot in this experiment. But when we add various concentrations of viruses to the polymerization solution, the currents get smaller. And what that suggested to us was that the, the virus particles are getting involved in the electropolymerization process. And we viewed that as a positive sign that they might be getting incorporated into the polymer film. When you look at these films in the scanning electron microscope, right, PDOT films that do not contain viruses are just flat and almost featureless, right? The polymer surface is very smooth. But when the virus particles are present in the polymerization solution, now you start to see texture on the surface of these uh, uh, P dot films. They are in fact P dot virus composite films. What I'm showing you in this slide is uh, our low magnification images at the top and higher magnification pictures at the bottom of exactly the same electrode. And so the numbers at the top, three nanomolar, nine nanomolar, 15 nanomolar, this is the concentration of virus particles in our polymerization solution. And 15 nanomolar is right at the solubility limit of a virus, it turns out. So you can't put any um, higher concentrations than that. These structures that are protruding from the surface of this film are bundles of M13 virus particles that are coated with the P dot material, right? So it's they're not single virus particles by any means. They're, they're ensembles of virus particles. They're bundles that are coated with this uh, um, electronically conductive P dot material. 
that's going to be our bioaffinity layer. And we can prepare these uh, films in literally uh, a minute or two in our laboratory. That's all it takes, that's all the time it takes to prepare these electrodeposited films. This is just an AFM image of exactly the same thing. And the blue areas here are the are, are the, the plane of the of the bioaffinity layer, if you will. And these brown objects here are the virus bundles protruding from the surface of the film. How do we know what the cons how, how much virus is being incorporated? You can't really get that from the SEMs or the atomic force microscopy, but we made um, quartz crystal microbalance measurements of the mass of actual virus bioresistor sensors, all right? We, and uh, the data that I'm sure, the graph shown on the left here uh, is a plot of, on the, on the horizontal axis, it's the concentration of virus particles in the polymerization solution that we're using, right? This is the solution that we're using to make the film. And on the vertical axis, this is the concentration of virus particles in the film that we electrodeposit. All right, and we know what the thickness of that film is. We know what its mass is, so we can we can calculate what the um, virus concentration is very accurately. And when we plot the virus concentration, all right, the concentration of viruses in the film versus the concentration of viruses in the solution, we get a stray line, right? The higher the concentration in the solution, the higher the concentration in, in, in the electrodeposited composite film, and the slope of the line is 500. And so the, the, um, the virus particles are very efficiently vacuumed into this uh, film, into this growing film, we believe by the electrostatic interaction between the M13 virus particles and this positively charged um, P dot chain that's growing as we electrodeposit it. We, ha we haven't been able to do a, a, a proper control to show that it's really this coulombic attraction uh, that's responsible for this efficient deposition. But suffice it to say is the deposition of virus particles using this process is, uh, is uh, extremely efficient. And we haven't found another way to do this, right? We've sprayed films uh, you know, for months trying to mimic um, the virus concentration and the properties of the uh, uh, composite films that we're making. And it simply hasn't been possible to do as well as uh, with electrodeposited films so far, to our frustration, frankly. Okay, so we have a bioaffinity material that we want to incorporate into the biosensor. How are we going to make the biosensor? Well, that part's super easy because we just start off with some gold electrodes on a piece of glass right here, the dimensions that matter. There's four electrodes here because we're gonna make two virus bioresistors on this piece of glass, on this glass coupon here, all right? And it's this 1.5 millimeter dimension that, that's critical, all right? Because we're gonna put a bioaffinity layer over all four of these electrodes because we wanna use pairs of electrodes like this to discern how much reproducibility um, derives from the bioaffinity layer itself, because here we have two VBR biosensors that are gonna share the same bioaffinity layer. And so we will have a direct indication of how much a variability, sensor to sensor variability is derived from the bioaffinity layer compared to other aspects of the biosensor, the gold electrodes and so forth. There's only three steps required once you have gold electrodes on glass. The first step is just to spin coat a P dot PSS layer on top of those gold electrodes. Just, this is just a commercial P dot PSS solution that we buy from Sigma Aldrich, all right? It's just a, it's just a solution of P dot and polystyrene sulfonate uh, in, an, in an aqueous uh, solution. All right, so we spin coat uh, a layer here, and as you'll see, it's about 150 nanometers in thickness. And then we attach a crude PDMS cell, all right, to the top of this after it's dried. We dry it at 75 degrees C. We put a, a, a very crude PD, PD, PDMS cell here. It's just an open container, if you will, for the plating solution, all right? And then we put the plating solution inside this uh, the cell, and we electropolymerize the, the virus P dot layer, and that's the final step, all right? And that point, you have a functional VBR, all right? All of these steps together 
require a few hours only because um, there has to be uh, there's a, a, um, some thermal steps involved, right? The, um, the spin coated PWSS, for example, has to be heated for about an hour at 75 degrees so that it uh, <clears throat> doesn't react or doesn't do anything um, um, untoward while we're electroplating the, uh, the virus P dot composite layer. So if you break one of these uh, slides in half and put it into the SEM, you can see that the, the top layer thickness is typically about 90 nanometers and the, the P dot PSS layer on the bottom, right? It's about 250 nanometers. But tuning the, the thickness of this bottom layer, this 245 nanometer layer, this P dot PSS layer, that thickness can be tuned over a range and that turns out to have profound effects on the sensitivity of the device that we're, we're making. And so it's one of the ways that you can tune the sensitivity of the virus bioresistors by adjusting the thickness of this bottom layer. And I'll show you why that's the case uh, in just a moment. Okay, so we've got uh, a, a layer of this um, virus P dot material right and on these gold electrodes on a piece of glass. And now we're just going to make an impedance measurement across that uh, conductive channel. And, and again, the conductive channel consists of two layers, the P dot PSS bottom layer and the um, virus P dot top layer. And in, you know, in, in, you know, I didn't know this before we started on this project, but you can just buy uh, urine, all right, uh, synthetic urine from Sigma Aldrich, or you can get urine from uh, any physician who has to has to deal with deal with it uh, in in the course of their practice. But this is just an, a synthetic urine experiment, all right. And you know the urine by itself, we see a semicircular impedance response. This is a so-called Nyquist plot. Here we're plotting the imaginary component of the impedance. That's the component of the impedance derived from the capacitance of the uh, sensor device. We're plotting that versus the real component of the resistance. This is the resistive component of the uh, electrical response of the biosensor. And we see this characteristic semicircle for every single VBR device that we make, right? This is what the urine looks like. And when we spike some of the cancer marker into the urine, here's one nanomolar of DJ1. That's the molecule that I'll be talking about the most today. The semicircle gets bigger. Okay, and if we extrapolate the semicircle to the real axis, that's what we're going to use as the signal in our virus bioresistor. The shift in the low frequency um, impedance with and without the, um, the molecule that we're trying to detect. Now, these semicircles, you know, are commonly seen in all kinds of electrochemistry experiments where there are are redox active molecules like ferriferocyanide or ferrocene or ruhexamine, all right? If you look at an electrode, you will always see a, a semicircular response here. But in this experiment, the semicircle is generated by the device itself. It's generated by the device architecture because the requirement for forming a semicircle is that you have a parallel capacitance and resistance. And we have that in the architecture of this device. And so we automatically generate this semicircle. There are no electroactive molecules present in this solution. The, uh, the two P dot layers, right? The P dot PSS and the virus P dot constitute resistors. There's also the solution resistance. And then there's the capacitance that couples the channel with the solution. Okay, and so in this device, we can turn off coupling to the solution simply by operating the device at low frequency, because at low frequency, these capacitors are open circuits. They don't transmit any charge to the solution. And so that's what happens is, is at low frequency, we're only measuring the impedance of these two resistors here, right? The virus P dot resistor and the P, uh, the P dot PSS resistor in parallel. We can't separate them. And we factor out the R solution, which turns out to be a boon for us because we wanna make measurements in urine and urine is famously diverse, all right? It, it has high salt concentrations or low salt concentrations, depending on how much water you've drank in the last hour. And so we wanna be able to make a measurement of a cancer marker without worrying about what the dilution is gonna to do to the, the signal that we're measuring. It turns out that the salt concentration of the solution or the buffer or the urine 
has no input at all into the concentration of the biomarkers that we're measuring because we can completely decouple the signal from these layers from the signal in the solution at low frequency. And so that's what this device is able to do. And that turns out to be incredibly useful for us. So for example, if we just change the concentration of, of DJ1 in three different experiments with three different sensors, the orange semicircle gets bigger, all right? And that's what we're, uh, that's what we're calibrating. So there's an increase in the impedance of this polymer channel that occurs in the presence of molecules that are selectively recognized and bound by the viruses trapped in the top layer. Okay, and I'll show you the control experiments that, that demonstrate that the selectivity for the molecule of interest is incredibly high. The other attribute of this device is that it can be extremely fast, right? DJ1 turns out to be a 22 KDA protein. It's a cytoplasmic protein that's overexpressed in bladder cancer, and that's the reason why it's a, it's a great bladder cancer marker, but it's a medium-sized protein. 22 KDA, and, in, and uh, in our experiments, we're able to generate a quantifiable signal, a signal that is good enough for us to use to measure concentrations within one minute. That is, you start off in urine that contains no DJ1, you suck it out of the uh, VBR, you, you, you now deliver urine that contains DJ1 at all of these different concentrations listed on the right here, all right, and within 60 seconds, you have a signal that quantifies that is, it's not proportional to, it's, it's uh, correlated with the concentration of the DJ1. And you can see that for, these are uh, four different um, uh, VBR biosensors. One thing to understand about the VBR is that there's no possibility of using it twice because the off rate for bound target is so slow that it's simply impractical to do that, all right? The off rate is, is uh, many hours and the on rate is, is, as I'm showing you here, less than one minute. And that's uh, consistent with uh, um, the, the KDs that we have for molecules like DJ1, all right? They're on the order of 10 to the minus 10. That means that there has to be that ratio for the um, on rate compared to the off rate. And these are just controls <clears throat> for different um, uh, uh, proteins and for sensors without virus in them and, um, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the signal that we measure, every one of these bars is a different VBR um, biosensor. Um, we simply see a very little nonspecific signal in these experiments. And that's despite the fact that we do nothing to block nonspecific signal. We rely purely on the, um, on the properties of the P dot, which does an excellent job of rejecting nonspecific adsorption from proteins that are not targeted by the viruses. So in 2017, uh, before we discovered the VBR, this is where we were with, with the, our biosensor project, right? We had just published this paper in analytical chemistry this is a calibration curve for HSA, all right? So this is the concentration of, of human serum albumin on the um, uh, horizontal axis. This is the signal that we're measuring in a non-VBR, right? Very similar biosensor, except the channel had a hole in it, right? We weren't actually using the channel. We were using two electrodes modified with virus P dot. And we were able to generate at most 10 ohms of signal in these devices. I'm somewhat astonished that we're, we were even able to publish this paper in analytical chemistry, but we did, all right? And we had only 10 ohms of signal at that time. Our limit of detection for uh, human serum albion was 100 nanomolar, which is not great. A year later, we discovered the VBR. We published a paper in nanoletters, and in that paper, we had 220 ohms of signal, all right? And our limit of detection for the same molecule was seven nanomolar. So we went from 100 to seven nanomolar in one year, this made us very excited about the prospects for this uh, idea. A couple years later, we've made some improvements right, to, the, uh, to the VBR. We've, we've uh, engineered the layers so that they have um, optimal thicknesses. Now we have 640 ohms of signal instead of 220 ohms and a limit of detection of 10 picomolar for a much smaller protein. 
right? This is DJ1 now. This isn't HSA. HSA is 66 KDA. DJ1 is 22. This is a, a little over a year ago. And then we discovered that you could improve the sensitivity even more if you killed the bottom layer by over oxidizing it. If you if electrochemically over oxidize the P dot PSS layer on the bottom, you can almost extinguish its conductivity completely. And now you have Met, uh, a kilo ohms of signal, all right. In the particular, in this particular case, seven kilo ohms of signal. You have more, you have more signal than you really know what to do with. And so, there are knobs that you can turn, on, even on the simplest biosensor that you can imagine, which is what this thing is. There are some knobs that you can turn to fine tune the sensitivity of the device to hit the sensitivity that you need for the measurement, whatever the measurement is that you're trying to make. All right, so the VBR has a tunable sensitivity, and most of the tunability comes from messing with this P dot PSS bottom layer. All right, because this top layer and bottom layer are a current divider. All right, and if all the if the P dot PSS bottom layer is very conductive, all the current flows to the P dot PSS layer, and you you don't recover the impedance signal from the virus P dot layer that's there. Right, because all the current's flowing through the more conductive P dot PSS layer. If you kill the P dot PSS, you re that signal is there and uh, in spades. So this is what a calibration curve looks like for DJ one. Um, really, what we want to point out here is that you know we've done these measurements in human urine, we've done them in synthetic urine, we've done them in single patient urine. Um, the the Every single one of these bars is a different VBR because as I said, we can't use a, a, a sensor more than once. And so, you know, they all have to respond to exactly the same calibration curve. And the only way to do that is to make them identical to one another. And so we are able to do that with the VBR to a high degree of, of, of success, mainly because the fabrication process is so simple, right? There's only three steps that you have to optimize and reproduce to make sensors that are identical to one another. And so we get COVs of 3%, 4%, 5%, 7%. These are unheard of in sensor to sensor reproducibility. And every one of these sensors is handmade at this point. So with, with some degree of automation, we should be able to improve on this reproducibility as well. And so the limit of detection here, as I said earlier, is about 10 picomolar, it might be a little bit lower than that. The key to ultra low sensor to sensor COVs, and this is essential for this technology. If you don't have sensor to sensor reproducibility, you've got nothing. You've got no technology here. They have to all be identical. The key is process windows, which is something semiconductor manufacturers have been using for uh, 25, 30 years to build integrated circuits and so forth. You have to look at, you have to develop metrics that allow you to discard sensors that are not going to be. Um, identical, all right? And so the yield that we have currently for this technology is about 60%, all right? Maybe it's a little bit better than that by now. All right, I haven't said where the signal is coming from. And let me just, because I'm out of time, say a, a few things about what where we know it's not coming from, all right? The signal that we measure in the VBR is always positive. It doesn't matter if the protein's positively charged or negatively charged, the signal is always positive. There's always an increase in impedance when target is bound, irrespective of what its charge state is. And one thing that we can do is we can flip the charge state on a, on a target molecule just by changing the pH around the PI. And when you do that, you still see exactly the same signal. Right, there's no influence at all on the protein charge on on um, on whether we measure or not by the VBR. The ionic strength doesn't influence the signal either. Right, you can look at a wide range of salt concentrations and you see exactly the same signal, provided you're making the measurement at very low frequency, which is exactly what we do. The signal that we measure is diffusion controlled. And what I mean by that is that big proteins are slower than small proteins. DJ1, we can measure in a minute, but if, you're, if we wanna measure an antibody, which is 150 KDA instead of 22, now it takes about 30 minutes for us to get um, a measurable signal. And so big proteins are slow 
in terms of response time. Small proteins are much, much faster. That's telling us something about what the mechanism is. And of course, the magic has to be in this p.pss layer, sorry, the virus p. layer, because the viruses are the receptors, right? They're in the p. the virus p. layer. That's where this, this magic has to be happening. So what we believe is going on in these experiments is exactly what happens in carbon-filled polymer resistors that are used for gas sensing, right? And specifically what happens is in the presence of a, a target gas, the polymer swells and you're at a percolation threshold for the carbon that's contained in the composite. You have a polymer carbon composite near its percolation threshold. When it swells, you have a large change in the resistance of that layer. We don't have carbon, all right? We don't have any carbon in this experiment, but we do have a semi-crystalline polymer, which is this P dot. There are crystalline domains, there are disordered domains. The viruses are mainly in the disordered domains. When protein uh, permeates into this layer, right? there's a significant volume change. We believe that's difficult for us to measure, but we're still working on that. That uh, reduces the connectivity of, of the, uh, the electrical, electrical connectivity of, of polymer chains and, and uh, that bridge these crystalline regions. The crystalline regions are typically very conductive. The disordered regions are less so. And there's polymer chains that bridge them. And these are disconnected when the um, target protein permeates and binds to these virus particles that are located in these disordered regions. <clears throat> So the idea is that transport through this layer requires interchain hopping, of course, that's been well known for a long time. Target proteins permeate this layer and interrupt interpolymer uh, um, interchain contacts. That's what we, we believe is happening. And it's exactly analogous to what we believe happens in, in um, carbon polymer composite uh, gas sensors. Although this is now a biosensor, it's not a gas sensor. And this swelling behavior is really uh, the key factor that controls this. And, and you know, the permeability is going to be highly correlated with the protein size, and it's going to be slow for big proteins and fast for small proteins. That's qualitatively what we see in these experiments. Now, can we be sure that there's the quantity of protein permeating that would be necessary to cause volume changes that would require many monolayers? many equivalent monolayers of protein to permeate into this layer to cause a significant volume change. But we have been able to measure this using coarse crystal microbalance gravimetry. And we see on the order of 10 to 20 mon equivalent monolayers, closed pack monolayers of protein penetrating into these uh, virus P dot layers. And so that's what's shown on the right hand side here. The, these numbers point 143 micrograms per, per square centimeter and 0 0.300 micrograms per square centimeter. That's the mass per unit area of, of um, close pack protein monolayers for small proteins and big proteins. So this is one measurement that seems to indicate that the quantity of protein being permeated into these layers could be um, sufficient to cause a volume change and, and uh, affect the kinds of conductivity changes that we're measuring. So that's my talk. Thanks very much for listening. I, I've tried to explain how we uh, create these VBRs and what our motivation is and how we control uh, reproducibility and what we think the mechanism uh, uh, might be operating. And I'd be happy to answer your questions. Okay, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. It's time for Q&A session. Okay, let me read the first question. Uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. Is there any precaution to take when handling the, the, the virus? Also, what solvent do you use to make a nanomolar solutions of vi virus? That's the first question. Um, you know, the virus solutions are just made in PBS buffer, mm -hmm. um, um, phosphate buffer, buffered saline. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can, you know, the, the solubility limit in PBS is about um, 15 nanomolar. And you know, when the solution gets cloudy, you know that you're above it. And it's, it's uh, very prominent uh, to see that. Um, 
There really aren't any precautions. These are not, uh, uh, so these, uh, you know, M13 is infective of uh, E. coli, and it turns out that M13 is an, a normal part of the uh, flora and fauna of your gut because E. coli is part of the flora and fauna of your gut, and M13 is, is uh, infecting E. coli all the time. M13 doesn't even kill E. coli, all right? M13 can infect an E. coli bacterium without killing it and multiply and extrude itself through the cell wall without, without ever damaging the E. coli. And so um, it's an incredibly harmless uh, bacteria, uh, a virus. It's a bacteriophage. It's, it's not a human um, virus. And so, uh, you know, there's a minimal amount of biosafety that we need to do with this, uh, with, with these um, M13 viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And let me read the second question. Second question. Uh, it seems that VBR should be made identically and reproducibly to obtain accurate uh, assay result. I wonder if the high uh, mut mutation rate of the, the virus is not an issue when producing large amounts of virus for the assay. This is the second question, okay? Genetic drift is always a problem with viruses like M13, and you have to monitor it by uh, sequencing the the the, um, the DNA of the virus right mm -hmm. regularly, and um, and and checking to make sure that the uh, performance of the of the virus receptors is constant as a function of time by doing ELISA. So we do ELISAs on every single batch of viruses that we raise to make sure that the affinity and selectivity is what we expect it to be. And it does drift. And so there are uh, precautions that one has to take. And this is really the purview of my uh, collaborator. Um, but uh, yes, that is, that's a real issue that you, that you raise is, is there are some, uh, precautions that have to be taken to make sure that genetic drift does not degrade the binding properties of your virus. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question, uh, thank you for the great talk. For the accessibility for broad user, uh, color metric sensing could be one of the options. Are there any strategy for developing color metric detection instead of electrical detection maybe? Uh, that's an interesting idea. We haven't devoted a lot of thought to it. I'm not quite sure how colorometric detection would work in this case because the phenomenon that we're using for transduction here is a uh, intrinsically electrical phenomenon. Um, it's the really the impedance of this layer. Now, you could always devise a sandwich assay uh, scheme, but that would defeat the purpose of using the sensor, I think, by making it much more complicated than it needs to be. But um, I'd be interested in trying to understand some ideas on how you would do color metric sensing for these things. Okay. Actually, there are more than 10 questions, but because of a time limitation, a little bit, let me just read the last question. Uh, I wonder how long the uh, self life of this VBR is? Um, it's months for sure, and we don't know how much longer than that because we haven't been doing testing for longer than that. But it's, it's several months dried and on sitting on the shelf, um, and so we're pretty encouraged by that. Uh, we're, we're not seeing a lot of degradation over a few months. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, answer, and let's uh, thanks again, Professor uh, Penner. Thank you for, for the wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you.